right now, we are living through history. Okay, we live through history every day, but we are living through a historic time, the type that future generations will ask us about. How will we reflect and remember this time in our history? Maybe you're like me and you've taken video of the past year's events to share with future generations. Maybe you've decided to preserve your experiences through interviews. Or maybe you've been inspired to create art that reflects the time we live in. Today's history hero is someone who lived through history, created poetry, and changed the literary world as we know it. So let's roll that intro. Welcome to Detroit History Heroes, the show where we talk about some fantastic Detroiters. My name is Kayla and I work for the Detroit Historical Society. Today we're talking about Dudley Randall, the poet and publisher who gave Black Americans a voice. Dudley Randall was born in July of 1914 in Washington, D.C. Even at that time, Washington, D.C. had a thriving Black middle class, and Dudley's family was a part of that community. His mother was a teacher, and his father was a preacher. Hey, that rhymes! His two brothers were writers as well. One was a reporter, and the other one was a poet too. But it was Dudley's writing talent that stood out immediately. Like most writers, he found inspiration in the world around him. After the age of four, he wrote his first poem after listening to a brass band play march music. He was inspired to write verses to the tune of O oh Maryland, My Maryland, which is the same tune as O oh Michigan, My Michigan, which is the same tune as O oh Christmas Tree, in case you were wondering. As a child, Dudley's family was very involved in politics. His father would take him to hear speeches from great men like W.E.B. Du Bois and James Weldon Johnson, the two founders of a new organization, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, or NAACP. The organization was founded to advance justice for African Americans at a time when the law upheld segregation and daily life presented many dangers for black Americans. Dudley's family moved to Detroit in the 1920s to a neighborhood called Black Bottom. This area of Detroit, which is now mostly gone, was the home of many African Americans in the city. Named for the rich soil that was in the area, Black Bottom was to Detroit what Harlem was to New York City. Life in Detroit was very different than it was in DC. Detroit's working class neighborhoods had heroes like Joe Lewis to idolize, so Dudley Randall spent his days acting tough and writing in secret. After winning a citywide youth poetry contest, he published his first poem in the Detroit Free Press at the age of 13. After graduating from Eastern High School, Dudley Randall began working for Ford Motor Company. During the 1930s, many African Americans working in the factories had to work the most difficult and dangerous jobs on the line. In this case, Dudley worked in the foundry at the River Rouge plant. He didn't mind though. He found that the monotony of his job allowed his creativity to flourish. This was during the 1930s, however, and as the country dived deeper into the Great Depression, Dudley lost his job. He was able to find work though as a postal carrier, a position he held until 1943 when he served in the Second World War. His wartime experiences greatly influenced his writing. Following World War II, returning soldiers faced a new world. As we talked about in our Rosie the Riveter episode, prior to the war, the US was still in the midst of the Great Depression, but the war had created a growing market, which led to an economic boom for the country. Additionally, the U.S. government passed legislation called the GI Bill, which was designed to help returning veterans as they navigated the new world with things such as college tuition, low-income housing loans, and unemployment insurance. However, these benefits were denied to the majority of returning African American soldiers who fought for their country. The denial was not necessarily upheld by the law, but in many cases, companies, banks, and universities discriminated against African Americans without facing consequences, an example of de facto segregation. Dudley Randall was one of the few fortunate African Americans who was able to access the educational opportunities that were promised to all Americans. As we mentioned in our Grace Lee Boggs episode, there were seeds of the civil rights movement during and even before the Second World War. Dudley Randall's work spoke to the ongoing struggle of African Americans to live in an equitable society. Dudley graduated from Wayne State University and then went on to get his master's in library science from the University of Michigan in 1951. From then on until 1973, Dudley served as a reference librarian at various universities, including University of Detroit Mercy. 
From the early 1950s onward, African Americans began a series of protests to push back against the Jim Crow laws in the South and the everyday racism that they faced throughout the United States, including here in Michigan. We call this period collectively the Civil Rights Movement. The efforts were led by Black Americans who would challenge these racist practices on every front, whether it was suing a school district, marching in the streets, forming organizations, learning more about their African roots, or challenging racist laws through direct confrontation. The movement was born from the blood, sweat, and tears of many people, and at times the forces of racism turned violent. I would like to give a content warning for the following story in our video because it was very tragic and involves the death of young people. But it is important for us to contextualize Dudley Randall's work as it was a response to the civil rights movement. To quote one of my favorite professors, I encourage you to engage with this difficult and uncomfortable moment because those who lived through that history were not able to walk away from it. But if you need to, you can skip to the time code below, okay? On the morning of September 15th, 1963, four members of the Ku Klux Klan, an organization that promotes and perpetuates violence against people of different ethnicities and religions, set off 15 sticks of dynamite in the basement of the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama. The basement was where the children's Sunday school classes met. The church had strong ties to the civil rights movement in the city, in fact, earlier that summer, the church had been the meeting place for the famous children's marches in the city. On that September day, 21 people were injured in the explosion and four young girls were killed. Addie Mae Collins, Cynthia Wesley, Carol Robertson, and Carol Denise McNair. Their tragic deaths became a catalyzing event for the movement. Outraged like many people were, Dudley did what any writer would do, turn his pain into art. He wrote the lines that would become immortal. Mother dear, may I go downtown instead of out to play? And march the streets of Birmingham in a freedom march today? No, baby, no, you may not go. For the dogs are fierce and wild and clubs and hoses, guns and jails aren't good for a little child. In 1965, Dudley wrote The Ballad of Birmingham, a poem that reflected on the tragedy of the 16th Street bombing as a conversation between a mother and her child. Dudley wrote the poem and distributed it as a broadsheet or a single piece of paper. He immediately garnered acclaim and caught the attention of other writers. And these new writers were part of a new generation of Black artists. Dudley and these creators were part of the Black arts movement. Now, before I jump in, let me put on my English and cultural history educator hat. Ah, right there, that's it. The Black Arts Movement was an art movement led by African-American poets, novelists, playwrights, musicians, and visual artists that focused on the Black identity. The movement was founded by writer Amiri Baraka, also known as Leroy Jones, as a response to the death of Malcolm X. Artists and writers focused on the self-determination of Black people in America, which meant that Blacks in America should value and create their own culture, their own artistic styles, and their own beauty standards, and the list went on. All right, let's keep talking about Dudley Randall. As part of the movement, Dudley Randall channeled his energy into poetry. His work was known for its simplicity in language and realism in subject. You know, the life of a writer is varied and interesting, even between different genres. So we talked to one Metro Detroit writer who writes science fiction, fantasy, poetry, and comic books, who can tell us more about their writing process. It's time for some flash footnotes. For our special guest for this episode, do you mind introducing yourself? Hi, I'm Saladin Ahmed, and I am a writer, uh, mostly of comic books. Uh, I've written a bunch of stuff, but right now I'm mostly writing Miles Morales and Ms. Marvel. But what are some of your favorite books and authors, and how have those works helped influence you? I've been a big reader since I was a little kid. One thing I always say to, to young people who are coming up and trying to become professional writers is to read everything. For me, as a writer, um, reading lots of different kinds of stuff mattered to me. So when I was a kid, I was reading Spider-Man and I was reading The Avengers and I was reading Conan the Barbarian, but I was also being told the stories of the Arabian Nights by my grandma, being read the Quran. I was 
Um, I was on my own discovering things like the autobiography of Malcolm X. I was finding all sorts of books that were speaking to me in other ways, other parts of me. I think that when you put all those kinds of sources and influences together, um, we're all sort of a mixed bag of things that have come before us and then mixed together in us. As you had mentioned earlier, right now you are working on Miles Morales. Um, you've also worked on Magnificent Ms. Marvel. These two comics have protagonists of color that are kids. What does it mean to you to bring these two protagonists of color to life, especially because um, historically the comic industry has focused more on protagonists that were not of color? As an Arab man, a Muslim man, uh, in a field where there aren't <laughs> where I'm the one. <laughs> Maybe there's a couple of us, but not many. It's It's been a balancing act between wanting to tell stories about these characters who are so important to so many people who change the face of what superheroes look like. If you only make the heroes look one way and sound one way and, and be from one place, that tells a dangerous story. It's really important to tell stories that, that show that our place is being heroes as well. At the same time, I think it's really important for artists of color to not get pigeonholed. At Marvel, at DC, wherever I write, also been like, I'm gonna write a Batman story too. I'm gonna write a, a Peter Parker story too, right? Because I think that, that that's crucial to say that, you know, that doesn't just belong to you either. If you're gonna share the toys, we're gonna to share all the toys. But when I go to tell the stories that are important to me that to create my own original characters, there's a reason that I tend to kind of create younger characters of color who haven't had their stories told because part of the thing with working with licensed characters in particular is it's kind of like there's this toy box, right? That people take toys out of if they're gonna make a movie, if they're gonna make a video game. You know, it's cool to be able to make your toy and say, hey, here's, here's the Lebanese guy, right? Here's the black girl from Detroit. Maybe they, you know, continue life after you. But both of these characters have actually been picked up in other stories. It's been, it's been exciting to see. So. In addition to Abbott, which is set in Detroit and about a Detroiter, how has your um, connection to the city of Detroit um, influenced your writing? Detroit has been a big influence on me. Um, it's where I was born. Even growing up uh, a little down the street in Dearborn, Michigan, uh, it was always a huge cultural influence for me. My father was very involved in the arts scene in Detroit um, in, the, in the 70s and 80s and 90s. It was a sort of uh, underdog town, you know, and, and I think we've still got that energy, but I really grew up with the sense that um, people were making art and making cool stuff um, in a place where people didn't expect us to and where people um, wouldn't necessarily give us uh, our props for doing it, but we were doing it anyway. My dad really was influential in kind of showing me that that was this city's real heritage and not um, some of the lies that were out there about the city. Uh, but even my work at Marvel, you know, I've, <laughs> I've been the guy from from the get there who's been like, you know, the world is bigger than New York City and, and Asgard, right? There's, <laughs> so I've already uh, introduced a couple characters there. Um, Starling, who is a sort of supporting character in my Miles Morales comic, uh, who's from Detroit, and uh, Amulet, a supporting character in my Ms. Marvel book, who's from Dearborn. Um, and it's, it's a place that will always speak to me and that I think will always have things to say to the world that the world needs to hear. Detroit knows what's up, you know, and, uh, and, and I think that uh, good art knows what's up too. Well, we just want to thank you, Saladin, for taking the time to meet with us today. In 1965, Dudley Randall created Broadside Press, a poetry publishing house. Amazingly, Dudley ran this business out of his own home and between his lunch breaks at his librarian job. He wanted to create a space that championed Black voices. Of course, he published his own work, such as his first book of poetry, Poem Counterpoem. But Broadside Press published so many more voices, some for the very first time. He shone a spotlight on some amazing writers, including Sonia Sanchez, Nikki Giovanni, Audrey Lord and Dr. Gloria House. Broadside Press has published almost 200 first-time poets since its inception in 1965. By creating Broadside Press, Dudley Randall opened up the literary world to black voices and broke down publishing barriers that had previously not allowed African Americans to flourish. Dudley's poetry was about the experience of being black while also having universal themes. Let's take a look at one of his most famous poems, On Getting a Natural. She didn't know she was beautiful, though her smiles were drawn, her voice was bells, her skin deep velvet night. 
She didn't know she was beautiful, although her deeds, kind, generous, unobstructive, gave hope to some, and help to others, and inspiration to us all. And beauty is as beauty does, they say. Then one day there blossomed a crown upon her head, bushy, bouffant, real afro down, queen of Fertiti again. And now her regal woolly crown declares, I know I'm black and beautiful. Although the poem refers to the black experience of wearing your hair in its natural state, the poem's content is about one whose beauty is constantly evident. The black experience, the universal theme. In 1975, the black arts movement dissipated. This was partially due to disagreements amongst the writers about their various political beliefs. But also it was because many of the artists had gained wide and universal recognition which was a goal of the movement, and this was in no small part to Dudley Randall's efforts. In the 1980s, two events took shape in his life. In 1985, Dudley Randall sold Broadside Press. Now in his 70s, he could focus on his new job, being the Poet Laureate for the city of Detroit. Appointed in 1981 by then Mayor of Detroit, Coleman A. Young, the Detroit Poet Laureate is a distinction of honor for poets who work to create poetry for the city. It was a job that Dudley Randall took seriously. In a 1989 interview, he said, I believe a poet can change things. He can change the way people look and feel about things. And that's what I want to do in Detroit. Dudley Randall died on August 5th, 2000 at the age of 86. Although he is less well known than other poets of his time, his legacy and impact is still felt today. Broadside Press, now called Broadside Lotus Press, it still publishes new black voices right here in the city of Detroit. Broadside Lotus Press is the oldest black owned press in the United States still in operation. The NBC drama, This Is Us, features one of its main and most popular characters, Randall Pearson, who was named for Dudley Randall and his book, Poem Counterpoint. Dudley Randall used his experiences, living through historic times and extraordinary circumstances, to challenge the status quo and to make amazing art and to tear down the barriers that once stopped people from being able to move forward. The footprint he left on the American poetry, publishing, and philosophical landscape is still visible everywhere you look. Thanks so much for watching Detroit History Heroes. Thanks once again to Saladin Ahmed for sitting down and talking with Dean and I about life as a writer. Make sure to subscribe to the Detroit Historical Society channel to learn more about your favorite Detroiters. Let us know in the comments which Detroit History hero you want to learn about next. If you want to learn more about Detroit history and Detroit writers like Dudley Randall, you can visit our website at DetroitHistorical.org. Follow us on Facebook at Detroit Historical Society. Follow us on Instagram at Detroit Historical. And you can follow us on Twitter at DHS Detroit. My name is Kayla, and this has been Detroit History Heroes. Thanks for watching.